Greetings, everyone, and thanks so much for being here this evening for another of the Charlevoix Historical Society's Zoom programs on our wonderful history. <clears throat> As many of you know, I have been writing an illustrated column for the weekly Charlevoix Career called Looking Back since June of 2011. What started as a 16-week experiment at the request of the courier is still ongoing. This coming Friday will appear number 590. That is not a testament to my industriousness. Well, of course it is. Who's kidding who? But it, to my, how much history there is in Charlevoix to report. In truth, I have been continuously uncovering through both research for the column and lucky discovery involving much else, much of what I never knew about this town ever since I began working part-time at our headquarters, the Harsha House in 1997. That's when I joined the board of directors filling my mother's seat after she passed that year. And in truth, surprisingly ignorant about my own hometown, even though my father, photographer Bob Miles, became the town historian. Museum director at the time, Betsy Reynolds, asked if I had any spare time to help her get caught up on an enormous backlog of work. I said I'd do what I could, which meant initially straightening out the document files, which endeavor turned into a love affair that has never ceased. I couldn't believe what was appearing to my benighted mind. I honestly wasn't very efficient, because I had to stop and read everything, which endeavor later turned into, to date, 10 books of various shapes and sizes, two DVDs, many exhibits and programs, all helping to put Charlevoix more out into the world than ever before. So this program is going to be different than any I've ever done. It has no single theme other than a selection of random facts I never knew about Charlevoix until they appeared in documents, photos, donations, oral histories, plus conversations with anybody who wanted to contribute to saving our history. So here goes, in no particular order, only as they came to mind. Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, an odd name, but his parents named him after an 1864 Civil War battle in Georgia in which his father had been wounded. <clears throat> they left out the second N in Kennesaw, however. A brilliant young man who became a lawyer, Landis was appointed a federal judge by Theodore Roosevelt in 1905. He gained national recognition when he fined Standard Oil of Indiana $29 million, the equivalent of $800 million today, for railroad tariff irregularities which judgment was reversed, however, on appeal. But Landis had been establishing himself as one tough, no-nonsense cookie. Look at that pugnacious face in his later years. His most famous case was tossing eight members of the Chicago White Sox out of baseball in 1920 for having thrown the 1919 World Series that allowed the less favored Cincinnati Reds to win. Because of the dark shadow it caused, the game throwing was called the Chicago Black Sox scandal. This decisive action made Landis a main candidate for the office of America's first baseball commissioner, which position he held from 1920 until his death, during which he did much to clean up the national pastime. The book and movie Eight Men Out were based upon the fixing scandal in Landis. Now, you may be asking yourselves, what does any of this have to do with Charlevoix? Only this. 100 years ago, late last May or early June, not long after the Black Sox judgment, he was one of the first summer guests at the 90 Room Hallett's Inn Hotel downtown, where Olson's is today. This is what the Charlevoix Sentinel newspaper had to say on June 8, 1922. Quote, <clears throat> that people of renown and more than ordinary celebrity patronize and enjoy this hostelry is evidenced by the fact that Judge J.M. Landis was one of the early guests of the season, that he was pleased with the place is certain, for he spoke in appreciative terms of the pleasant surroundings and courteous attention 
paid to other guests and to himself. It is a well-known fact that Judge Landis is not profuse with complimentary expressions. That was an understatement. Years of experience on the federal bench in the handling of cases where compliments are of rare occurrence and where such phrases are practically obsolete, no doubt has much to do with his infrequent use of compliments. Hence his open expression to the hotel management was considered as out of the ordinary and duly appreciated. Other persons of note will patronize Hallett's Inn and express themselves in words of praise concerning the many excellent qualities of the place. Of those that have been or will be made, the one by Judge Landis will be the most pronounced, standing out like some of the famous decisions made by him while on the federal bench. Two years later, legendary defense attorney Clarence Durrow made his appearance in Charlevoix, but that's another story. I didn't include it because I already knew it. My father crossed paths with Darrow when he was here. Did you know there was once a diving board on the end of the South Pier? The man at far left looks like he's walking on water. Wouldn't that be a tourist attraction? Is there anyone watching who has not had the pleasure of attending one of our August waterfront art fairs in East Park? This is the first one in 1959. It took hours to set up. Speaking of artists, a few miles out on the Boyne City Road, just before Horton Bay, there stand two tilted anchors on the right side of the road. <clears throat> they mark the anchorage, once the vacation home of Nathan Cummings, head of Consolidated Foods, later the Sara Lee Corporation. Cummings had amassed one of the finest private collections of modern art in the world. Many of his prizes kept right outside Charlevoix. Here, Nate admires his Alberto Giacometti standing man at the Red Arrow, the last Giacometti that came on the market, sold for over $140 million. I'm sure many of you have been in Diane and Bill DuPont's Round Lake bookstore downtown. Had you ever stepped in over a century ago, this is what would have met your eye. Greek immigrant George Gladys at far right owned the popular Sugar Bowl Cafe in the Butters Building for about half a century. Here he is posing with his 1910 soda fountain, 14 feet long of mahogany, marble, silver, and plate glass. It cost just over $2,000, the equivalent today of almost 63,000. Rumor has it that the current faux French fishing village facade on the building now is going to be restored in the original shown at left. And did you know that? Just before the end of World War II, in the summer of 1945, you could fly round trip to Detroit from Charlevoix more than you could to Beaver Island. Three times a day versus two. Look at the top, the phrase reinstitution of operation. Those downstate flights were happening before the war began. And that at one time, the community Christmas tree stood smack in the middle of the US 31 Bridge Street, Clinton Street intersection. Let's sound out new mayor, Lyle Jeanette, city manager, Mark Haydlaw for the street department and give it a try next holiday season. Ferryman Sam Alexander, <clears throat> excuse me, Sam Alexander in Ironton, five miles south of town on the south arm of Lake Charlevoix, became a legend for the half century he spent at his job. He was featured in Ripley's Believe It or Not. Ripley said of Sam, he traveled 15,000 miles and was never farther than 1,000 feet from his home, more like somewhat under 600 feet. His house was across the road from today's landing waterside restaurant. Look closely at the fourth line of words at top right. You're seeing correctly, the county operated the ferry free for decades. The 200 plus rooms Beach Hotel at the end of West Dixon Avenue was torn down in 1967. A $1 million nine story circular structure 
to be called the Holiday Towers Resort Hotel with pie-shaped rooms at top was planned to replace it complete with a revolving restaurant, a radical new concept at the time. This was later reduced to six stories of rooms at bottom, <clears throat> drawn by local architect Jack Pigro, but neither one ever came to pass because of money issues. Today, this is the site of the Lacroft Condominium. 429 Michigan Avenue was constructed in 1913 by David May of St. Louis, founder of the once renowned May department stores chain throughout the Midwest. Michigan Avenue was nicknamed St. Louis Alley because so many resorters from that city built their large seasonal homes along it. May enjoyed summers here for a decade and a half before passing away in Charlevoix in 1927. Its retail empire went on to become Federated Department Stores, which was brought into the Macy's fold. And Charlevoix once had a Chinese laundry on Bridge Street, owned by Gui M. Lee in the 1890s. Mr. Lee was highly respected here and had a unique ability. Some of you may still sprinkle your clothes when you iron them, if anyone still irons anything. Rather than using a bottle topped by a spray hole stopper, Lee would fill his mouth with water and spray with a Charlevoix Sentinel newspaper called Shirt, shirt Bosoms from there. Visualize that one. <clears throat> Who watching has never been stopped by the bridge? Do I sense a collective blood pressure rising? Stay calm. I thought this primal scream in th therapy inducing bother had been going on only in my lifetime, but it's been happening for over a century. By the way, we just found out that for 2022, the Michigan Department of Transportation reports that the Charlevoix Bridge was raised and lowered around 3,400 times, and MDOT statistics reveal that for the same year, the ADT, the average, I emphasize average, daily traffic crossing figure was determined to be 14,316 vehicles. Multiply that by 365, and that's just under five and a quarter million vehicular passages over our span last year. How many watching are University of Michigan alumni or have a connection to U of M? Some of you know how you can walk down the bluff to the Lake Michigan Beach, where Michigan Avenue meets Division Street. Just to the right of the parking area and walkway stands a fairy tale house, hardly visible, built by Virginia Young Olson, our renowned, renowned builder in stone, Earl Young's daughter. Virginia tore down the house shown here to make way. It was built in the late 1800s as a summer residence by Michigan professor of Greek, Albert Pattonville. That's him at top left. While he was attending U of M in 1867, Pattonville was chosen to be one of three on a student committee that finalized the famous U of M colors, hurrah for the yellow and blue. A superb athlete himself, he was later on the committee that formalized the formation of the future named Big Ten Conference and served as the equivalent of today's director of U of M Athletics from 1898 to his death in 1906. This photo of John O'Neill's fisheries dock on the northeast shore of Round Lake shows his men repairing fish nets at rear and attaching wood floats to their netting seated in the foreground. In 1902, John O'Neill put out 125 miles of these nets in Lake Michigan, using only three fish tugs to do so. Great Lakes fishing began to crash over just over a decade later. Small wonder. <clears throat> in 1884, Charlevoix's first telephone exchange was installed in the residence of a local named Marshall. Charlevoix started with 20 telephones. After constantly growing demand warranted, a larger exchange was installed on the second floor of Dennis and Druggist George Crowder's 1875 building seen here. 
where that French place, the crepe shop, is today. The Sentinel newspaper reported in May of 1885 that, quote, <clears throat> the Boston Telephone, the national organ of a telephone exchange, states that Charlevoix has more telephone subscribers in proportion to its population than any town in Michigan. What was a telephone exchange? You would lift up your telephone receiver to connect to it. The operator, always a woman, would say, number please. You would provide, and she would plug you into that number's hole in the panel. Hence the phrase, make telephone connection. <clears throat> In 1923, the, the exchange was moved again across Bridge Street to today's Cherry Republic Building, second floor. I can remember when I was very young that my father's parents lived in a remodeled barn behind our house on Park Avenue. There's something was exciting in the wind and I had to tell my grandma. Instead of running across the backyard, I decided to call her instead. But in my excitement, I forgot her number, 528. The operator said, number please. And all I could think to say was, I want to talk to my grandma. She replied, hello, David, I'll connect you. Now that's life in a small town. <clears throat> the last of the operators left in 1972 when direct dial came into play for this region. Alvin York was the most famous American name to emerge from World War I. His life and exploits were turned into a 1941 biopic starring Gary Cooper, who would win an Oscar for the portrayal. In late 1932, York, a deeply religious man, spoke on the stage of the Charlevoix School Gymnasium, today's public library stacks area. His topic, why I am for prohibition. He must not have spoken convincingly enough because prohibition was repealed the following year. This was the first cement plant constructed on Lake Michigan's South Point, just west of here, to harvest the extremely high quality calcium carbonate limestone <clears throat> beds that were discovered to extend downward to at least 500 feet. When a courier in <coughs> Interim editor Steve Zucker, who suggested the looking back column 12 years ago, saw this. He said his first reaction was it had to be a bootleg whiskey still in the Ozarks. But from little acorns to mighty oaks grow, from Medusa cement in 1967 to Southdown cement to CMEX out of Mexico to today's St. Mary's, owned by a family from Brazil. They currently completed a $150 million expansion job to keep up with demand, much of which you see to the left of the storage silos. <clears throat> Actually built in 1840, not in 1790, as it says in fine print at the bottom of the ad, the success became one of the top tourist draws in the world, welcoming aboard, so it claimed, over 20 million people. <clears throat> Its claim to notoriety was having served as a convict transportation vessel between England and Australia. What is known for sure is that it was a more stationary convict prison ship anchored in the Melbourne Harbor. The success arrived in Charlevoix in July of 1927 for two weeks. On her final Sunday, 6,000 people paid to come aboard to learn tales and legends of the horrors of trans transport that would have made P.T. Barnum proud. Charlevoix was said to have been the last stop on her Great Lakes tour before leaving for the Atlantic. The boat made a return trip 10 years later. later. Taken out of service due to old age, the success burned to the Lake Erie water line near Port Clinton, Ohio in 1946. Ever curious about how Northeast Bridge Street near the bridge once looked? <clears throat> These were some of the first commercial buildings to be constructed downtown. Beneath the pipes sign in the middle is the road down to the city dock, pretty much where it is today. The building second from right is the Charlevoix Central <clears throat> newspaper offer, office mentioned before. At extreme right, right, once stood a big livery barn, not a spot of land that takes you down to the Bridge Street tap room. 
These structures were removed in 1941 to make way for an already contracted for a new bridge. A Pearl Harbor came along in November and bridge construction had to wait for over five more years for a world war to end. Uh-oh. <clears throat> I already knew this one that had to include it when I stumbled across it again. All of a sudden, in 1988, our lighthouse took a decided lean to the north. It was discovered that the entire North Pier had to be replaced. Recreational scuba divers reported that when they went exploring here, the pier's old foundation boulders and cement chunks had deteriorated or washed out to the extent that they could travel through large gaps, large enough to allow them transit from the channel underwater through the pier to the municipal beach. This revised new pier designed with a rectangular inset to lessen the impact of incoming waves lasted only long enough until public grousing demanded that the old design be brought back, which it was. But nobody tells Lake Michigan what it can or cannot do. Not long afterward, wind, waves, and currents combined and began lifting and knocking the first section out at the arrow, creating a potentially lethal safety hazard. After several redesigned replacements and head scratchings as to exactly what to do, which attempts never worked for long, the Army Corps of Engineers said enough was enough. This is how it looks today, the one day after the last of the demolition equipment left last September. The 185-foot Mizpah <clears throat> was one of the most stunning palatial yachts that ever called Charlevoix its summer home port, with gold-plated doorknobs and a crew of 27. Her owner was Eugene McDonald, head of the Zenith Radio Corporation based in Chicago. McDonald took the boat to Cocos Island off Costa Rica for testing of a rudimentary form of radar that was found to have potential the scope of radar's future use still unrealized. In 1932, he arrived with a boat full of guests, one of whom was Gutson Borglum taking a break from carving the faces on Mount Rushmore. <clears throat> Logs used to be hauled through town from the lumber camps once to our south, coming in as shown here on State Street, then turning right on Park Avenue, heading east, at least one of them turning left on Bridge Street too fast and dumping its logs in front of the Sentinel office. What is it about a chain only as strong as its weakest link? Demonstration here. I'm curious about how they got those logs out of there. Imagining this happening today on a July weekend. So then it was across the bridge up to East Dixon Avenue, turning right, and heading to the Round Lake Bluff behind the houses from where the logs were carefully unloaded to form what were called rollways all the way down to the waterline. <clears throat> they look pretty precise here. They glance to the far right to see a hint of what usually happened. It looks like as winter wore on, the log workers got so tired of what they had to do that the rollways progressed east from winter east from order at left into chaos at right. Once the ice was gone on Round Lake, all the logs eventually ended up in the Charlevoix Lumber Company's huge watery log boom from where they were pulled ashore into the mill for processing. My father remembered that when the supports of each rollway were knocked out and the logs tumbled into Round Lake, you could hear them go clackety boom all over town. 100 years ago, in February of 1923, a 16-year-old boy named Jesse Cole was injured in a logging accident on Beaver Island, suffered a fractured skull that put him in a coma for three days. <clears throat> there was no doctor on the island, plus no wintertime connection between Ed and Charlevoix at the time. An emergency call for help went out from Cole's older sister in Chicago to Selfridge Air Base in south southeastern Michigan, which resulted in a plane sent northward to fetch Charlevoix's doctor, Robert Armstrong, 
who had volunteered to fly over. But before it reached Charlevoix, the plane had foul weather and had to land almost blind in the Gaylord Grayling area south of here, where it got stuck in a snowbank. Another plane of its type was not available, but this one pictured here was at Selfridge, an open two-seater biplane called an Osprey II. You can see the lettering on the left. That plane made it. Dr. Armstrong flew over, stabilized young Cole, and flew back the same way, nonchalantly calling the bitterly cold Pioneer Venture jolly. And that event, showing a definite need for medical availability for the island's residents, precipitated the beginning of air service from Charlevoix not long after. Come to find out, this particular first time aircraft turned out to be the personal plane of what was called the Air Services General William Billy Mitchell, he being at the time in Texas. A call was made for his permission, which he gave. Mitchell loved the Osprey line, considered to be one of the most effective flying war machines of its day, seen here with a previous model. Almost three years later, Billy Mitchell was a household name in America. He had been lobbying for 10 years, even before the United States entry into World War I, for the separation of the Army and its nascent air service into two entities, realizing what a strong but separate air power meant for future defense. He was brought to trial for insubordination, his rank reduced to colonel, and in December 1925, found guilty of a, quote, almost treasonable administration of the national defense. Rather than face any more harassment, Mitchell resigned shortly afterwards. He was, of course, proven right. In 1955, a movie was made of the incident, again starring Gary Cooper, and in 1999, his nation honored Mitchell's foresight with a stamp including what looks sure enough to be an osprey. The first light to guide boats into Round Lake was put in place on the South Pier of May in 1880. It was nothing more than a lantern atop a scaffold about 18 feet tall, placed in a box with a hinged door. What we were never able to find out was, when was it taken down after a real lighthouse was installed on the North Pier in 1885? Serendipity time. <clears throat> Sometimes the answers to our questions have been hiding in plain sight all along. A few years ago, we mounted the current soon to be taken down exhibit at the museum on the history of photography in Charlevoix. Our first permanent professional, Daniel S. Way, took this of the most tragic maritime incident ever to rock Charlevoix, the burning of the passenger steamer Champlain in June of 1887 29 people lost out of 56. Note the two boys sitting atop the scaffold at the end of the pier in the place of the light box. Purely by chance, next to this image, we wanted, mounted Way's image of a wave breaking over the South Pier that September. Lo and behold, no scaffolding appears. Voila, mystery solved in an instant, summer of 1887. The 250-room inn hotel at the end of, East, end of Dixon Avenue at the East End, second largest in Michigan after the Grand on Mackinac Island, opened in 1898 to serve our railroad passengers. But as the years progressed, the automobile became more popular and the inn could provide almost no parking spaces. So in the 1920s, it built the gabled building on the left a couple of blocks away as a 50-car garage to help alleviate the problem. The inn was closed after the 1940 season and torn down in 1941, but the garage was spared because in that year, the Mummers Actors Troupe of Chicago, considered to be the Steppenwolf Theater Company of its day, came to Charlevoix for summer stock performances. And the refurbished garage was a perfect fit for the prestigious group. So successful was the venture that the six week season was extended to eight. And who was in the company? An up and coming Audrey Totter, 
not yet known for her Hollywood days as cinema's go-to tough girl. And Les Tremaine, in his day, a huge national name, basically in radio. That's him at bottom. Tremaine's Hollywood career, however, never achieved liftoff, but we can remember him as the uncredited narrator of the sci-fi classic Forbidden Planet, one of my all-time favorite movies, and as the auctioneer in the Alfred Hitchcock masterpiece North by Northwest. Great plans were in the works to bring this company back in 1942, which would have made Charlevoix one of the prime summer stock destinations in the country. A Pearl Harbor happened a few months later, and our anticipated theatrical glory days went up in the smoke of war. These were Charlevoix's first courthouse and jail, constructed around 1870. It was reported that for the first court session, the courtroom at left was so filled with curious spectators that the floor collapsed. It was less than two feet off the ground, however, so no one was hurt. When a new town hall, later to be the county building, was put up in 1884, these buildings were no longer needed. And in the 1890s were moved a block away where a family lived in the courthouse and the jail became a garage. One of Charlevoix's earliest pioneers, Morris J. Stockman at Wright, built the first brick building on Bridge Street at the Clinton Street corner in 1880 to house his hardware business. He later took on Harvey Lee Innings, our future first mayor, in 1905 as a partner. Look at the right photo, the blank wall slanting back about W.J. Orser, the artistic tailor. It was on that wall that Earl Young, our widely renowned builder in stone, replicated a 30 foot wide rendition of his artist wife Irene's fantastic yard square 1934 sectional map of Charlevoix County and part of Emmett County. These maps can be found all over the country, one of the best sellers in our museum store. The enlarged painting of it lasted until December of 1945, when a gas explosion in the Maneva Cafe ruined the interior and the building had to come down in the new year. Oddly, the Historical Society possesses only this one photo of the enlarged map. But to give you an idea of its scale and reach, which descends all the way to the grass, there is this one of me at age two in 1942 with my maternal grandfather, Ed Goldstick, on a bench beside the wall. Born in Riga, Latvia, an immigrant to the US in 1900, he would pass away the next year, so I never got to know him and learn about my roots in Eastern Europe. Did you know that Charlevoix had his very own opera house? <clears throat> a cultural necess necessity for any self-respecting community in the early days. That's it on the left. Where was it located? On prime property, right next to the channel and bridge, where the lawn now slopes down to the water. The hotel had to come out in 1947 to make way for the construction of the bridge that year. Inside, the auditorium could hold 800 in a beautiful setting of white, maroon, and gold that became a focal point for so many town events, much like the community room of the library today. The street level had two commercial stores either side of the entry stores that led up to the auditorium. They can be seen at right, far right. What would you be looking at today if you were brave enough to stand out in the middle of Bridge Street? This viewpoint would go right over the deck of the View Wine Bar. The man at far left reminds me of a hamburger-loving wimpy in the Popeye comic strip. Beginning in late June of 19, 1892, a local called the Dummy ran between Charlevoix and Petoskey for many years. And on August 23, 1912, a Pier Marquette passenger train left, left Petoskey at 2.40. About six miles northeast of Charlevoix, it ran head on into the dummy. The fault was the trains because at a certain point it was supposed to slow down to be sure the dummy was safely off on a siding to allow the train to pass or wait for that to happen if the dummy wasn't yet there. An inexperienced new crew had not been advised of this and barreled on 
only to meet the dummy coming toward them. It was too late. 14 were injured, some seriously, but no one was killed. Look at the bottom right of the photo, taken by none other than our builder in stone, Earl Young, who had developed into a very talented photographer also. There were once two rafts and a diving board platform off a brand new East Park installed in the late 1930s. But not long afterwards, swimmers and divers began to get sick until someone finally realized that wastewater from all the boats was going right into the lake, not into holding tanks on shore as required today. The diving platform was taken down, swimming forbidden in Round Lake, and the rafts relegated to the beaches at Lake Michigan and the depot. Further up the shore around the same time, Earl Young had his eye on the Shalloway Lumber Company property, hard hit by the Great Depression and barely hanging on. He envisioned a big new resort development here, and in 1941, commissioned a wooden scale model that showed a 60 room hotel and convention center and left, and a restaurant providing a panoramic view of Round Lake, the channel and the bridge off to the right, along with a new marina. But again, World War II started for the US later in the year, and Earl's dream never reached fruition. Today, the Edgewater Inn fills the land. <clears throat> Shalloway's handsome fourth school <clears throat> was erected using white brick in 1889 on the ground now occupied by the Shalloway Public Library's parking lot. Here so new, the ground has yet to show grass growing on it. Note the imposing steep steeple over the school bell. In April of 1903, a bolt of lightning demolished it, damaging the building also to the total extent of what would be today of just under $35,000. The bolt reached down into one schoolroom, blew the door off its hinges and threw it half the length of the room, missing a seated student by only three feet. Laster and flath on one of the walls were shorn clean off the underlying brick. Almost half of the windows ended up cracked. <clears throat> Fortunately, no one was injured. As you can see, the rebuild did not include a pointed lightning inviting steeple. It's the early 20s <clears throat> and Buster Brown, the nationally known comic strip character, plus his faithful dog, Tige, an American pit, bull, American pit bull terrier, were coming to town. How do I know this? Not the newspaper, but my mother telling how giddy with anticipation everyone was, especially the entire school population, and she was eight or nine years old at the time. The comic strip was created in 1902, became enormously popular, which led the Brown Shoe Company to buy rights to the character two years later and create a cultural and sales phenomenon. Little girls strap at Mary Jane shoes were named after Buster's girlfriend, who was named after the comic strip creator's daughter. It became an iconic childhood shoe style. Oops. That's Buster or the youngster hired to impersonate him. Pretty funky, right, with his page boy hairdo? There were several impersonators plus chaperones at one time going around the country doing this. Buster and Tige were here standing are here standing in the alleyway behind today's townhouse bar. The photo on the right is at the downtown corner in front of the North Seas Gallery wall where Buster and Tige performed on a platform. platform. Yes, Clinton Street was even blocked off for the occasion. My mother told me that she was lucky enough to stand beside Buster Brown, but that meant nothing to me at the time and I forgot all about it until, <clears throat> Not long ago, the society was loaned local shoe store owner and Buster Brown event sponsor, Don Campbell's entire photo album connect collection to scan all we needed from his life. Here is Don's first shoe store, almost brand new in the early twenties. When I enlarged the photo, sure enough, there she was standing right beside him as she said, I would recognize that face anywhere. And where was that plate glass window and shoe store entry located? On Bridge Street, at the Park Avenue corner where Berkshire Hathaway Realty is now. Again, taken by Earl Young, 
when he shot every single building on the west side of Bridge Street on an early morning in 1934. <clears throat> 1929, a parade of county snow plows downtown. This photo is extremely valuable in that it is the only one we possess showing the entire East 300 block of Bridge Street where it was torn out <clears throat> before it was torn out for East Park in 1937. Earl Young also took photos of the entire east side of Bridge Street the same day he took the west side, but unfortunately they were stolen and we don't know if the negatives ever survived. <clears throat> Did you know that famed American poet Sarah Teasdale in her younger years had a connection to Charlevoix? Her father John, again of St. Louis, who had made his fortune in the fruit business, had purchased either this house or a remodeled and enlarged version of 307 Michigan Avenue, where the Dunes condos stand today at the same address. The family named their new purchase, the redone version behind the tree at left, Alta Sound, where Sarah spent several of her youthful summers. Sarah Teasdale would go on to become one of America's most prominent poets and received what is now regarded as the first Pulitzer Prize in Poetry in 1918. John Teasdale died in 21 at age 82, and neither Sarah nor other family members ever came back to Charlevoix. Inspired by her stays here, Sarah Teasdale wrote a beautiful haunting poem about our town called Schooner's Charlevoix Harbor that was published in either Scribner's or Harper's Magazine. It begins here in the Blue Lake Harbor I watch the steam ship steam in, as does everybody else who's ever come here. <clears throat> and did you know that there were once two towers near the top of Mount McSaba, overlooking Lake Michigan, just know the town? The first at left was built by photographer Daniel S. Way in spring 1891 as an attraction costing 25 cents to climb. <clears throat> at the top, a magnificent view that reportedly that reportedly covered about 2,000 square miles of Northwest Lower Michigan. Besides his photography business, Way was also a developer. And in late 1890, he had bought property near Mount McSaba for a resort project. Marketing of, the, marketing of the lots had begun in January of 1991 and 60 were sold the first week. The tower was the icing on the cake, but it blew down on Thanksgiving day in 1905 six years after Way's tragic death by drowning in Southern Lake Michigan, and was never replaced. <clears throat> a few years later, the local life-saving service, later to become the Coast Guard in 1915, put up a lower replacement on a, as a lookout tower to watch for Lake Michigan vessels in distress. The public was not allowed to climb on this one, only servicemen. The right-hand photo was taken in 1920. And now the final image. Every once in a while, something comes into the historical society that makes my heart skip a beat. This image arrived in one of two photo albums brought purposefully from Glendale, California to us to scan and preserve its images. Accession and use all we wanted was turned out to be well over 200. It shows our first North Pier, the only close up I've ever seen taken from the outer wood section to the shore a clear view emphasizing the original 1872 wood cribbing in the channel at right and the precisely laid flatter boulders along the top. Notice how these provide a relatively safe walking path between wooden pier and shore. The helter-skelter rock placement of the pier that replaced this one was a jagged rip rap threat to life and limb to walk upon quite unlike the one we enjoy today. And with this final image of what makes people want to return to Charlevoix again and again, it's the arrival of treasures like these that make working at the Harsha House and its museum such a rewarding experience. And I'm thankful for the privilege because they allow us to be able to do and produce so much with them. And thank you so much for the pleasure of your company. I hope you enjoyed this glimpse into a Charlevoix that many of you, I'm sure, never knew about. Come over to Harsha House sometime to peruse the photo collection. We only have 12,000 images waiting to be searched. <laughs>